So welcome back to Physics of Music. Let's start with a quick summary of the physical rules that we understood so far. So we'd understood the rules that govern the physics of isolated objects or objects in outer space not interacting with any other objects. We understood that these rules come fundamentally from the properties of symmetries of the environment of outer space. And we had the following three different rules that took the form of conservation laws. So a conservation law means that there's some quantity that is required to stay unchanging in time. And so we said that if you have an environment which itself is unchanging in time, there's a quantity called energy which is conserved. If you apply that just to a stationary isolated object, its energy is just its mass times the speed of light squared. And so energy conservation tells you that the mass of an isolated object has to stay constant. If you have an environment which has a translational symmetry, that means if you move in some direction, then the environment looks the same as it did before you moved. In that case, we have the conservation of momentum in that direction. Because momentum is the mass of an object times its velocity, and because we said that mass had to stay the same, the velocity of an object in one of these directions also has to remain constant. And so we see that that was Newton's first law, and that came from thinking about the conservation of momentum. And then finally, last time we talked about the conservation of angular momentum for an object with a fixed mass and a fixed size, the conservation of angular momentum implies that the rate at which it's spinning has to stay constant. And so that was a derivation of the other rule that we had for physics in outer space, again from a conservation law. And so today what we want to do is start thinking about some more interesting physics when we have objects that can interact with each other. To start, I'm again going to think about an example in outer space that illustrates a lot of really important physics. So let's have a look at this particular simulation. This is Vlox. Vlox lives in outer space. And once in a while, Vlox does this. Let's see that one more time. Here we go. So let's have a look at what we just saw. And what we want to do is think about how to understand what we observed in terms of the physical rules that we've worked out. So in the starting situation, we kind of just have one object. Vlox is this outer space being that's sitting there. Its velocity is zero. But then all of a sudden, Vlox expels a ball from its mouth or nose or whatever this is. And one thing that we noticed was that at the same time as the ball was traveling to the left, Vlox is traveling to the right. So we can ask, why is that? Why does Vlox float backward when it expels the ball? So see if you can think about that in terms of the conservation of momentum. It's a good place to pause the video, see if you can come up with an explanation. And if you can, see if you can answer this quantitative question, predicting what the speed of Vlox is in the direction to the right. Okay, so let's talk about this. What does conservation of momentum tell us in this situation? So our environment is outer space. 
we know that momentum in any direction is conserved. And so let's think in particular about momentum in the, say, momentum to the right. So in the initial situation, nothing is moving, and so the momentum is equal to zero. In the final situation, because momentum is conserved, we must also have that the total momentum is equal to zero. But the ball is moving to the left, and so the ball has a momentum which is negative. The only way for the total momentum to be zero is if Vlox is moving to the right so that Vlox would have a positive momenta, sorry, momentum, and then the two momenta have to add up to zero. So that's how we can understand why Vlox must be moving. If Vlox were stationary, then there would be this total momentum, which is not zero, which would be moving to the left. Okay, so we understand that Vlox has to be moving, and now we can be quantitative about it and understand how quickly Vlox will have to move in order that momentum is going to be conserved in this situation. And so we have that the ball has mass two kilograms and it has an X velocity of minus five meters per second. And so its momentum is the product of those two. The momentum of the ball is two times five or minus 10 kilogram meters per second. Those are the units of momentum. And so what we can conclude is that Vlox must be moving to the right and must have a momentum of positive 10 kilogram meters per second. So Vlox's mass times its velocity must be 10 kilogram meters per second. Their mass is 10 kilograms. And so we can conclude that their velocity in the x direction must be one meter per second. And in that way, we have 10 meters per second, 10 kilogram meters per second momentum for Vlox, minus 10 kilogram meters per second for the ball, and the total momentum then adds up to zero. So we see that conservation of momentum, even in a situation where two objects were interacting with each other, it was very powerful and allowed us to predict something about the final outcome of this process where Vlox spits out the ball. So that's just our first example of a situation where we have an interaction between two objects, Vlox and the ball. And during this interaction, the momentum of the individual objects can change. Now let's think about something a little bit more down to earth, just a typical process in which the momentum of something might change. So for example, if you have a ball or another object and then you push it with your hand, then the ball might start moving. And so this is an example where we, are having, we have an interaction between the hand and the ball. And as a result of this, the ball ends up with some momentum. So we want to start to get more quantitative about this. We want to understand how we quantify the strength of such a push and how that would allow us to predict how much change in momentum there's going to be. So there's one really important point about momentum and it's kind of why it's useful a lot of times to talk about momentum rather than velocity. So to illustrate that, I wanna think about this example where you give the same push, somehow you're pushing with the same amount of force We'll say exactly what that means later, but on two different objects. So our expectation is that after the push, if it's the same amount of force, the same kind of push for each of the two objects, the larger, more massive object at the end of this all is going to be moving slower than the smaller object, which we expect would move faster in response to the same push. So the velocities are going to be different even though it was the same push. But one of the nice things about talking about momentum is that if you give the same push, the same interaction to two different objects, 
they're actually going to end up with the same momentum. There's a way to understand this, actually thinking about the physics in outer space again. So I'll just tell it to you. It's not super important to understand this, but just so you have an argument for why I'm saying the momentum of these two balls should end up being the same. So imagine that you're doing this experiment in outer space and you give an equal push to two different objects. So from your point of view, you're feeling exactly the same thing. And so this recoil that we saw in the Vlox example, so you would again be floating backwards as the balls are moving forwards. If it's exactly the same way that you're pushing in each case, you're going to be floating backwards in exactly the same way both times. You'll have the same momentum both times. And so by conservation of momentum, the balls will also have the same momentum. So this is a way to understand why equal pushes are going to lead to equal changes in, a, in momentum, even though they lead to different changes in velocity. So given that, we can come up with a useful definition for a quantity called force. So this is a very precisely defined quantity in physics. It quantifies the instantaneous strength of a push or a pull. Okay, so let's just break that concept down a little bit. If I'm pushing on something and then it ends up having some velocity, this is actually something that takes place over a period of time. I might be pushing softer at the beginning and then harder and then softer again. And so in order to quantify the strength of pushing, we actually want to come up with something that tells me about how, how much am I pushing at an in instant in time, not the overall amount of push. There's a different quantity that we, we use for that. But the important thing for us is going to be this instantaneous strength of pushing. And so if I want to diagnose that and relate it to, um, say, some property of the object that I'm pushing that I could observe to figure out how hard I'm pushing, we can use the fact that the push causes the momentum to change. And so it should be clear that if I push harder, that momentum is going to change faster. And this turns out to be precisely how we can quantify the force. So you can imagine getting some standard object and then you give it a push and at any instant you can look at how quickly is its momentum changing and that is the thing that we're going to define to be the force of the push. Okay, so this is the essential formula about force that it's equal to the rate of change of momentum that it produces. And so we could measure that using some standard object, but remember equal pushes give the same change in momentum for any objects. And so we don't, it doesn't matter which object we choose. Okay. So this is a really important relation. It's actually one of Newton's laws. And so we can state that by saying that there's this identity between force and the rate of change of momentum. Okay. So there are various ways of writing this. So one of the most basic is just that, that which is, you know, we kind of took it as a definition that you could measure force in that way by looking at how much the momentum of a standard object would change. Um, but then because it applies to any other object, you could do the same push and then you could use it to predict the rate of change in momentum. Okay. So the other standard way that you often see this equation written is just to write, just by writing momentum in terms of mass and velocity, realizing that mass is not going to change typically. And so instead of saying that force is equal to the rate of change in momentum of something, you can say that the force is equal to the mass times the rate of change of the velocity of that thing. This rate of change of velocity is also the thing that we call in physics acceleration. So we'll probably say more about acceleration next time, but for now, let's just keep talking about the rate of change of velocity. So I wanna tell you the most useful way 
that we can express this relation, this Newton second law relation. Or for me, it's the most useful way to think about it. And it's a way that emphasizes that this equation is going to allow us, again, to predict something about the future behavior of a physical system. So the way that I like to think about Newton's second law is that it equates the rate of change of velocity, it allows you to predict that if you know the force that's acting on an object and the object's mass. So if you take the force that's acting on the object, divide it by the object's mass, then that will tell you the rate of change of velocity. And we're about to do an example where we go through that. Before we do the example, I just want to talk for a minute about the units that we use to describe force. Okay, so velocity is meters per second. Mass is usually measured in kilograms. And the rate of change of velocity, okay, so that would be how much does velocity change in a given amount of time. So we would say, that the rate of change of velocity or the acceleration that's in units of meters per second per second. Okay. So something could be accelerating five meters per second every second. That means its velocity is increasing five meters per second every second. And so the rate of change of velocity would be meters per second per second, or sometimes in physics, we say meters per second squared. So the units of force then using this relation, would be kilograms times meters and then per second per second or per second squared. So that's a bit unwieldy and so we call that combination of things a newton. Okay, so one newton is one kilogram times one meter per second divided by one second. You might be wondering well what does it mean if there's one newton of force? So there's an easy way to think about that. One Newton of force is the amount of force such that if you pushed on a one kilogram object, its velocity would increase by one meter per second every second. So we usually use these units of Newton to, just to say how strong a push is at a particular time. So here's an example for us to work through. We have a hundred kilogram rocket it experiences a constant force of 5,000 newtons. So that's much larger than the one newton force that we just talked about. If the rocket starts at rest, what will be its speed after five seconds? So before we get into doing this problem, I wanna mention that the way this rocket works is exactly like the Vlox problem that we talked about before. Remember, Vlox was spitting out a ball, and in order to conserve momentum, Vlox had to be moving in the other direction. So it's really interesting that rockets work in exactly that way. They send out some, well, they burn fuel, get it really hot, and then they expel it through the rocket engine. That's going in one direction, and the rocket goes in the other direction. So the point of the rocket engine is to send out this burnt fuel as quickly as possible. So it's just trying to get that very, very hot and to send it out at a very high velocity so that it has a large momentum and then the rocket will have, will have to have a large momentum in the other direction. So take a couple of minutes, pause the video and then work through this question. Everything you need is here on the slide and then we're going to talk about it. Okay, so let's go through this. So we want to know the velocity or the speed after five seconds. And so in order to calculate that, what we'll do is first figure out how quickly the speed is changing because of the rocket engine. Here's where we use our basic equation that the rate of change of velocity is the force divided by the mass. So we get 5,000 Newtons we divide it by 100 kilograms. And if you remember our definition of Newton and how that relates to the other units, what we end up with is 50 meters per second per second. 
meaning that the velocity increases by 50 meters per second every second. So now we can answer the question because if we know that the velocity increases 50 meters per second every second, then after five seconds, it's going to go from zero to 50 to 100, 150, 200, 250. Okay, so after five seconds, the velocity is going to be equal to 250 meters per second. So this is a really crucial equation in physics, this relation that tells us the rate of change of velocity in terms of the force and the mass of the object. I want to emphasize that this is another example of an equation that is allowing us to predict the future behavior of some physical quantity. And next time, what we'll talk about is that just in general, we can predict all sorts of interesting things now if we can just understand the properties of various kinds of forces. So in everyday situations, when we're talking about physics on Earth or musical instruments, particularly for this course, or even sound waves or how they interact with our ear, there are various kinds of forces. And if we know how to quantify those forces, if we could figure out what they are, um, that will allow us, given the configuration of a system at one time, how things are situated and how they're moving, we can use this to predict how those velocities will change in the future. And then we already know that velocity allows us to predict how positions change in the future. So with this equation, together with the definition of velocity and our understanding of forces, we'll be able to kind of understand the behavior of pretty much anything in our, in our sort of classical everyday experience. Okay, so that's all for next time. And we're going, that's all for this time. And next time we're going to get into some more examples of using this equation and, and doing these predictions of the future.